So um, next we have uh, the public-private angle. Um, we have uh, Vanina Laurent Ledoux, I hope I pronounced that right, from um, MSD. She's the Director of Public Policy and Corporate Responsibility for Europe and Canada and is considered a global expert in corporate responsibility. Uh, she's worked in both public and private sectors in a variety of roles from fundraising to public policy and uh, corporate social responsibility. Concern has had a relationship with MSD over the last number of years and we're very grateful for their support and their support for this conference. So I'll let Benina now do her, her presentation. Thank you. So good morning everyone. It is an honor to be here in such a great company. Thank you, Suisanke, for the fantastic talk and it's been a pleasure following you on Twitter. So <laughs> looking forward to many more interactions. Um, so I'll speak today about the notion of shared value creation and uh, the importance of public-private partnerships to deliver this. You see two pictures above. And for me, they represent a thousand words, or even maybe two thousand in this case. On the left-hand side, you see some people giving a vaccine in Nicaragua. And in 2006, that program made history because it was the first time that a new vaccine was being introduced in a developing country at the same time as in the developed world. In the right-hand side, you see another picture. That's a midwife in an African country, and this represents our new um, commitment, 10-year commitment to maternal health, and I'll come back to this. So I will today briefly explain what corporate responsibility or corporate social responsibility means for MSD, and then I will discuss some public-private partnerships that we have entered in, and lastly, I will conclude by presenting, presenting some of the key learnings that we got on the way but of course, we are still very much in a learning mode. So the idea is to discuss with you at the end of the talk and see um, you know, how you can complement these and whether uh, they make sense for you. So first, who we are? Well, we are a global healthcare leader working to help the world be well. What does that mean? Um, we are the number two pharmaceutical company and we operate in 140 countries. We are committed to increasing access to healthcare, and I'll explain to you what we mean by this. And uh, as you see on the bottom of the slide, we are delivering prescription medicines, but not just that, also vaccines, biologic therapies, and we do, do also have animal health products. We're an island, and we here employ over 2,000 people. You see the six sites we have here. And we've invested over 2 billion euros in Ireland over the last five decades. Actually, we manufacture and package many of our key products here in this country. And in 2012, we contributed over 2 million euros in support of medical education, local communities programs, also healthcare professionals uh, specific education. And lastly, in our work towards environmental sustainability here in Ireland. Sorry. So, corporate responsibility is a daily commitment for us at MSD. And what we mean by this is that we are committed to continue discovering innovative drugs and innovative drugs to address the most difficult health challenges. But we do so while growing our business in a sustainable way. Corporate responsibility is grounded in our company's mission to discover, develop, and provide those innovative products and services increasingly to save and improve lives around the world. But importantly, it is guided by a set of core values that we have developed over the years, such as scientific excellence in everything we do, integrity again in everything we do, and diversity and expanding access, for instance. So we have primarily developed four areas of focus in our corporate responsibility approach. We are a pharmaceutical company, so I guess access to health makes sense for us, and it's the most logical way to focus our efforts. But as a large company, we also face 
greater expectations in terms of our environmental sustainability. We have always viewed our employees as our greatest asset, and our motto is help the world be well. Well, we believe that we cannot do this if we don't start at home. So employees are a very important part of what we do. And lastly, and I've already mentioned um, this, uh, we agreed that everything we do must be done in a transparent way. And it must be done against a high backdrop, back, backdrop of ethics and integrity. Stakeholders demand more and more transparency, and we are here to provide this. So I'll turn now to the second part of the presentation, and basically um, the idea is for me to explain two key public-private partnerships. So this is just a snapshot because MSD has entered into many PPPs, as we now call them. So I like pictures because, um, again, I think they explain a lot of things. Um, two more pictures for you here. On the left-hand side, you see a little boy guiding his blind father. And that's a site that was very familiar in many African rural areas. And the second picture, you see a young girl, and she's carrying a young sister after her mother's death. So I'll explain what this means for us. But first, we value partnership because we recognize that the complexity of the challenges we face in global health, and specifically in the developing countries, are totally beyond the ability of any single organization or country for that matter. And the Ebola crisis is, again, a very um, sad sign of this. Um, now, let me explain um, the longest program we've had, Mechtisan Donation Program. It's a program that has had an effect well beyond healthcare. That's why I said it was interesting to present that one to you today. So it's a multi-sector partnership, and we've established this in cooperation with various national governments, NGOs, and international agencies um, across the world. And the idea is to fight oncocercosis, or river blindness, as it is commonly known. It's the single largest public-private partnership in the world, and it's been used as a model for many other public-private partnerships. We are now entering the 27th year of the partnership. I don't know if you know this disease, but river blindness, blindness is a very debilitating disease, and it is being transmitted by the bite of a black fly when you're bitten and get the disease, it causes a lot of itching severe skin disfigurement, and eventually can lead to total and definitive blindness. It's uh, endemic in 35 countries, mostly sub-Saharan Africa, and more uh, limited areas of Central and South America, and also in Yemen. What we know is that there are an estimated 30 million people at risk, with more than 100, uh, sorry, 100 million people at risk, with more than 37 million people infected. And the disease has blinded almost 3,000 people. So in 2000, in 19, sorry, 1987, recognizing the importance of a drug that we had incidentally developed, Mechtisan, we decided to give that drug until the disease was totally eradicated. So we made that historic decision to supply the drug to all that needed it, and again, for as long as it, for how long it was needed. So now, 27 years afterwards, we have donated more than 4 billion tablets, and uh, 140 million treatments are donated annually in more than 30 countries. So these are big figures, but what we did um, was not to stop there. In 1998, we also made a second decision, which was to expand the Mechtisan donation program to include another disease. And that disease is a disease called, known as lymphatic filariasis or elephantiasis. So 
in, since my English is so bad, and it's uh, commonly known as Elephant Man. And for those of you that have seen the movie, you will immediately associate some images to this. Unfortunately, it's a disease that is very common also in Africa. And um, we've again decided to make sure that those that needed Mactizan would get it also to prevent that disease. In terms of outcomes, we are very proud because in the last two years, two countries in um, South America have eliminated the disease, Colombia, and just, that, uh, just two weeks ago, Ecuador also received the WHO stamp of approval for the end of the transmission. In Africa, the distribution of Mactizan has stopped the disease in nine districts in Uganda and also in some districts in Mali and Sudan. And importantly, this program prevents more than 40,000 cases of blindness annually. So what are the challenges? Because we're here to discuss, and it's good to have good results, but we recognize that this doesn't go without trouble. So this public-private partnership is still facing tough challenges, and the first one is actually competing public health priorities. We've mentioned malaria um, and some others. Evolving health agendas are um, sometimes complicating the mandate of these partnerships. Logistics, secondly, are very difficult, especially in African countries. River blindness, as you would have understood, is a rural disease, and reaching the last mile is often the most difficult thing. The last thing is also communications and acceptance. Communication to local communities is a challenge, and it is a challenge because acceptance of such uh, drug donation is not a given, and it is never a given. And every year, we need to reinvent the wheel in communication, in local communications. So this partnership um, has overcome some of these challenges and keeps overcoming those challenges thanks to the stakeholders um, around the table, and thanks to the local communities that are involved in the program. Local communities, but also global experts that are really making a difference and helping um, overcome those challenges prove fundamental. In terms of lesson learned, I'll spare you the clicking of the bubbles, but the first thing that we've learned so far is that, again, programs and partnerships need to adapt to an, inv an evolving environment. With the Mechtizan donation program, we have gone from first river blindness to elephant man disease eradication. Then we've gone from river blindness control to river blindness total em elimination. And finally, now we are moving from the river blindness and elephant man disease agenda to the broader neglected tropical disease agenda. And I guess you all know that this is going to be a big topic uh, in the coming years um, with the UN agenda. So this is really something that we are now getting involved in. The second thing that we have learned is that relationships with what we can call the other components of the golden egg triangle, namely donors, uh, both at countries level, but also at WHO and NGOs level, um, and the local communities and the local recipient countries are very, very important. And I've already mentioned the importance of um, working with local communi communities to ensure donations acceptance, but lastly, consistency with the WHO drug donation standards is also very important and much more difficult than you would think. And uh, integration, where feasible, with other existing partnerships has also proven fundamental for us. In countries where they have uh, different um, drug donations programs, if we can bundle this, it's the um, best uh, thing that we can achieve. So in terms of programmatic and public health results for that partnership, all endemic countries are now reached for river blindness. Most of Latin America has stopped the transmission of the disease. I mentioned Colombia and Ecuador already. And importantly, and I mentioned this at the beginning, uh, the Mectizan donation program doesn't affect 
the health of communities only, but it is very much delivering economic value as well. And by this, we have um, achieved more than 62 million acres of arable land protected, meaning that local communities can return to self-sufficiency. And that is very important because it really touches among many other components of development. Now, I'd like to um, turn to the second public-private partnership that I would like to present now, and, and pause for a second, actually. Because actually, during the remarks I've just made on the Mexican donation program, somewhere, a woman will die trying to give life. As every day, 1,000 women die from preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. Teenagers are twice as likely to die. And that is a woman every two minutes. So recognizing the importance of this global challenge and also seeing that it was something not addressed um, that much at global level, MSD joined this global fight and we decided that we'd be in for the long term. MSD for Mothers is our new program and it is a 10-year program, half a billion dollars committed by the company uh, for this long-term effort with global health partners. And what we want to achieve is a world where no woman dies giving life. Here in Ireland, we've established a three-year partnership with Concern Worldwide and focus on two key projects that will help address the issue of maternal mortality and morbidity. Of which, so far, 50 projects in 30 countries. We're going beyond the dollars because that's what we really want to do. We are partnering and we are not just funding. Actually, most of the projects you see on the map behind me are being co-created with local partners. There's no point having MSD walking to Vietnam or Colombia or wherever and um, you know, trying to teach the local communities what they should be doing to prevent maternal death. So everything we do, we do with underground partners. But that doesn't prevent us from leveraging our expertise. We have uh, tried to bring the best of MSD to this challenge and will try to do so for the next 10 years. And we're bringing our business mindset because we are business. So we apply our scientific expertise, but also our market-based solution to those 50 projects with our 75 partners, and the list is growing. But I'd like to um, present you just one uh, of these partnerships, and it's a program called Saving Mothers, Giving Life. And um, we've entered into that partnership with the US and the Norwegian governments as co-donors, sorry. Um, two NGOs, as you may see, the U.S. College of OBGYNs and, uh, very importantly, with the Ministries of Health of Zambia and Uganda. And I'm presenting you that program because we are all already seeing some uh, great uh, signs of success. In Uganda, we are seeing a 30% reduction in maternal mortality ratio in the Saving uh, Mothers Uganda District. In uh, Zambia, the Saving Mothers program has increased the number of women giving birth in health facilities. What we are doing also is to train healthcare providers because we recognize that it's a really um, multidisciplinary issue as well. And so in Zambia, uh, up to date, more than 200 healthcare workers have been trained. trained. A lot of uh, doctors, 150 doctors, but also nurses and midwives. <laughs> so in Europe, what we're doing is to focus on minority and migrant mothers because we recognize that the issue is very different here. Um, and I will uh, not uh, dwell too much on this, but again, you see two pictures of women that you've probably met around the corner here uh, at Trinity College Dublin or um, seen in other European countries where you live. 
Lastly, I would like to mention that philanthropy is an important part of what we do. And in 2013, we've donated uh, more than uh, 100, that more than one billion and eight hundred dollars. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I'd like to share the key learnings we got on the way. We have uh, tried to analyze uh, what we've done good and what was not so good in the public-private partnership we've entered in, together with a consultancy called FSG. And so they've um, worked with us to outline five characteristics of high-performing PPPs. Do I have five more minutes or do you want me to go straight to the end? Two more minutes. So I'll actually stay on that slide and then we can take Q&A to discuss the other key learnings. So first of all, constant adaptation is key. Um, the second thing that we've learned is that you need to invest in knowledge, both to guide dissemination making, but both to guide decision making, but also for dissemination purposes. I guess that many of you here are working in PPPs, and it's very important that you share what you are learning on the way with colleagues, with other NGOs. Uh, we've heard from Sisonke that civil society organizations now need to enter the boardroom. Well, that's a key learning in itself, and it's very important that uh, this gets shared with other civil society organizations. But what we also learned is that we need to partner with local governments and set up specific mechanisms to engage. It's not enough to say that it's a public-private partnership and hope that uh, engagement with the public sector will uh, be done by itself. You need to set up the appropriate governance mechanisms and revisit those very often as public health agendas uh, keep changing as we have seen. Fourth, if this is about public-private partnerships, well, you may want to leverage the power of the private sector and its entrepreneurial skill set. And lastly, again, we've heard this many times already today, plan for uh, sustainability. You need to be sure that uh, the project is in for the long term. And the last thing that I'd like to say is that, um, in my mind, probably all public-private partnerships need to have almost a suicide date in mind. And by this, I mean, you need to be sure that you can kill the program at some point in time because it will mean that it has achieved its objectives. And I used to work for Gavi. It's a vaccine um, public health uh, organization funded by the Gates Foundation at the beginning. And when we set up the Gavi mission and the governance mechanisms, we always thought by that you know, 2020, we would kill ourselves. So let's see if that works, but that was, that was the idea. And I believe that something very important. So what does the future look like? If you want, uh, I can just leave the slide there because it's kind of self-explanatory and take some questions and I'll end there. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Melina. That, that was very interesting and a lot of food for thought there. So we'll take a couple of questions very quickly, if there's questions. Um, Anita there in the middle of the red, and behind her is another lady. So we'll do those two first. Sure. And then maybe, um, there's one over this side as well, for maybe they can pass the mic back, and if you go over that side to the man at the back. Sorry. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Anita. Hi, thanks, Hi, very, thanks much very much for your presentation. Your presentation. Uh, my name is Anita Friel. I work with Oxfam. Uh, I'm a medical doctor by training. I worked in Africa for a number of years. I've seen firsthand what medicine can do for your blindness. Uh, so, of course, I applaud what Merck has done. Uh, there are those who say that when Merck discovered the, gar the drug, which was by chance, there was no purchasing power. So Merck, in a way, was had no choice but to donate the drug. But having said that, I think still think it's you know fantastic what was done. My question is about another type of criticism towards Merck. There are those who say that. Uh, the ar the, there is the argument that the blocking of the generic uh, medicines, which still goes on you know, by Merck and other pharmaceutical companies, would have far more reaching uh, you know, negative impacts as far as global health is concerned compared to any uh, corporate responsibility programs that the pharmaceutical companies, including Merck, would do. So what is you know, your company and you know, other pharmaceutical companies, obviously you can't speak for all of them, but at least, you know, from Mark, how do you respond to that? Thank you. Thank you. Do you want 
take a few first. Yeah, whatever yeah, okay. you want. Hi, my name is Mayara. I'm a student from Brazil, and it's very interesting your work in MSD. But I'm just thinking, if you are helping also the prevention of this disease, or just focusing the treatment, because we will still giving like the drugs and not helping the people to get empowerment and fighting against by themselves. Is it a comment? If it's a comment, yeah. If you are help, if your organization help also to give uh, empowerment for the communities or just the treatment. Okay. And we'll just take one more question there. Okay. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Ayana Musi. I'm a pharmacist, and I'm here with uh, Rise Global Health Initiative. Um, my question is about the partnerships you form for the maternal care. When you form the partnerships with the government, do you form them directly with the governments or do you have intermediary agencies who are on site that kind of go as a go between between yourselves and the government? And in terms of the kind of support that MSD offers, is it support in terms of training or is it support in terms of funding for medicines? That's my question. Thanks. Sure. Okay, thanks. So um, first of all, I'll uh, take the questions about the generics, which is a generic question in itself, <laughs> because it, indeed it is a very um, important question that um, is being addressed to all pharma companies in uh, all global health settings. So uh, I cannot respond on behalf of the whole industry, of, as you would understand, but for Merck and, um, it, it, you know, basically the important thing to remember is that we usually say that it takes a billion to discover a new drug. Uh, this figure has gone up. Um, what we uh, see is that we need to pay for this research and development investment. We are a private company. We are not a charity. And so the big um, bulk of what we do is uh, to, return, um, to get a return on investment. Once that return on investment has been reached, as you know now, most of pharmaceutical companies have a generic department, so we do um, have uh, generics of our own drugs. Um, and uh, we strive to, again, uh, provide access to those that need it in all settings. But it's um, basically a question of finding the right balance between um, investment and access as always so there's no perfect answer and i'm sure my answer will disappoint you and i'm happy to have a coffee to discuss further um but there's um there's, this is what we do really now talking about the mechtizan uh, donation program i think uh, that, that your question was about mechtizan right so do we only Ah, it was about the block, oh, sorry, uh, going back to your question. So the blocking of the generics, uh, it's the same, same issue of you know, return on investment. If we don't get to that point of return on investment, sorry? Let's not, I think we won't get into a debate and you can have a chat yeah. afterwards. Just yeah. because it's the podcast. I'm happy to have a chat with you. Just <laughs> in the interest of time, we'll just Thanks. See, get the questions answered. Yeah. So on the Mechtizan um, donation program, is it just the treatment? So for this program, yes, we focus mostly on the treatment, but as you will have seen, we also do some community building efforts. Um, what we do is, again, I've just presented two public-private partnerships. Um, so Mechtizan is mostly about treatments, but we, again, try to work with our other public-private partnerships. So for instance, in um, the Mechtizan donation countries, which are 35 countries, um, we work through a number of other mechanisms to provide different services to local communities. So that's the way we do it. It's, uh, we, we try to have a specificity in that program and make sure that we keep it for its success, but then we work through other mechanisms. And that goes uh, probably back to the question about partnerships. How do we partner with local governments? Um, it depends. Uh, for the Merck for Mothers program, for instance, in Zambia and Uganda, it's been directly with, with the ministries of health. Um, what Merck has uh, done through these programs, and maybe it's of interest to you, is basically to focus on three areas, product innovation, because we have had um, a long-standing presence around women's health products. So we were bringing already some expertise that was needed by those governments and didn't need to go through intermediaries. But we've also focused on accelerating access and lastly on global 
um, health leadership. And with this, we may work with different types of intermediaries um, to ensure that the, this agenda is being taken at global level. So I hope that that's answered your questions. Okay, great. I, I won't take any more questions just in the interest of time, but, but as Benina said during the coffee break, she did. So thank you very much. And